We thank you that you've given us opportunity to serve you another day. As we take up the study of your word, we're still desiring to understand truths connected with the last six verses of Daniel 11. So we ask that you'd grant us the presence and direction of your Holy Spirit, that we might understand these things correctly. We ask that you take control of my humanity and overrule it for your glory and your honor, that uh, what I convey will be truths that edify your people, that accomplish what you have intended for them. We ask that also that you would open the hearts and minds of your people to understand these things. We want the latter rain poured out upon us. We ask that you prepare our vessels by forgiving us in any area that we are preventing <clears throat> the full reception of the latter rain that you're providing as you open our understanding to your word. We thank you for this day of life. We ask now that you would bless our study in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, in part six of this series on Habakkuk tables, we are dealing with 1989, Daniel 11, verse 40, <clears throat> and this is study 53, but I think there was a recap in there that I may not be counting, but we began our study of Daniel 11, verse 40 back on study number 41, so we've, we've covered through 12, maybe 13 presentations, and uh, where we, when we began to look at Daniel 11, verse 40, in terms of it being the verse that marks 1989 as the time of the end for the 144,000, and therefore marks the point in time where the dirt brush man of William Miller's dream arrives and begins to unseal the book that's sealed with seven seals. When we began this study, um, we've, we spent some time identifying the time of the end of 1798. And then we identified that no matter what you understand about the verses of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, that they're obviously the events connected with the close of probation because in Daniel 12, 1, Michael stands up. And from there, we emphasized a parallel that we've been making throughout this series, that being that William Miller, the messenger of the first angel's message in the Millerite history, presented a message that was the events connected with the close of probation, and that William Miller had been prefigured by John the Baptist, who presented a message that was the events connected with the close of probation, therefore identifying that the message of the last six verses of Daniel 11 is a parallel to John the Baptist and William Miller's message which in each of their respective histories was the first message. So Daniel 11, 40 to 45, at the prophetic level, is the first angel's message in this history, though it is technically the third angel's message. But at the level of the fact that every reform movement is structured upon two messages, the message that identifies the events connected with the close of probation is the first. Um, from there, because one of the, we're trying to do many things here, because we are suggesting that Daniel 11 verse 40 marks the time of the end in 1989, and because the time of the end in every reform movement is the time when there is a prophecy unsealed that is going to accomplish the everlasting gospel for that generation, and because this is the generation that all the Bible pointed forward to, then the logic that we apply is that Daniel 11 verse 40, as the marker of the time of the end, would of necessity be one of the most profound verses in God's Word. And so where we started was, one of our starting points, was to show that from the beginning of verse 40, 19, 18, 1798, until Michael stands up down here, that that history is essentially, not, not perfectly, but essentially it's the history of the Laodicean church. Okay, if you start Laodicea in the 1850s, um, prior to the 1850s, you have Sardis and Philadelphia, Philadelphia there too, but pretty much the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the history of Laodicea. So we went in and we showed 
that each of the seven churches of Revelation are repeated in the history of Laodicea. And from there, and at that same time we showed you that the, the seals repeat and enlarge upon the churches. The first church is the history of the first seal. They tell different stories from that same history. So we there went and showed that the history of ancient Israel was governed by the seven churches as well. Okay? The time of the deliverance from Egypt was the time of Ephesus for ancient Israel. The time of the judges was the, the time of Smyrna for ancient Israel. The time of the, the kings until the captivity in Babylon was the time of Pergamos. It was the compromise of those kings that took them into captivity in Babylon, just like it was the compromise of Constantine and the Christian church in the time of Pergamos that took the Christian church into captivity for 1260 years. We noted that the time of the captivity of 70 years in Babylon was the time of Thyatira for ancient Israel. And immediately after the 70 years, <coughs> we noted that in Zechariah the question is raised, how long? And we line that question of Zechariah up with how long? With the fifth seal in Revelation, when the martyrs under the altar asked the question, how long? So we showed that the history of the seven churches is all repeated in the history of Laodicea, therefore it's all repeated in the history of the last six verses of Daniel 11, and therefore the history of ancient Israel is also repeated in the history represented by the last six verses of Daniel 11. There's a lot of reasons to identify that, but one of them, a simple one, was to show the, <clears throat> the depth of these verses that were unsealed by the Lion of the tribe of Judah in 1989 to possibly shake awake the Laodiceans that are hearing this to the fact that, yes, what we're, the claims we're making about Daniel 11 verse 40 are valid. They are um, correct that these verses are more than simply an interesting passage in prophecy. <clears throat> then we went into, uh, and we, we, I'm not touching everything we did, but we began to look at Daniel 11 verse 40, and we identified every word in Daniel 11 verse 40. There was 51 words. words. You may not realize that we addressed all of them. And I'm saying this on purpose. William Miller one of his rules is that every word must have its place in the prophetic scenario, and you'll find that many of the voices in Adventism that have the wrong view of the last six verses of Daniel 11, invariably, there are passages in those verses that they just throw their hands up and say, I'm not sure about that. They're sure about two things. They're, they're sure about their erroneous understanding of the last six verses of Daniel 11, even though there are some empty spots in their understanding, and they're sure that what we're teaching is incorrect. But we have an understanding of every word in the passage. And we went through that, and then we looked at the history of 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union and noted that what we're suggesting about that verse is identical to the history of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. And we also noted <clears throat> that the secular historians from that time period, invariably, when they were confirming the history that we're suggesting is represented in those verses, they drew words right out of verse 40 to illustrate what they were teaching. Okay, for instance, you know, the, the one magazine that gives the chronology of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the title of that particular magazine, which the days of the whirlwind, and of course in Daniel 11 verse 40, the king of the north sweeps away the king of the south as a whirlwind. <clears throat> so we took time for that, and then we began to look at some other biblical themes that are in the last six, six verses of Daniel 11, and one of those was Michael. Daniel's last vision is chapters 10 through 12, and right at the beginning, D Michael is brought into the story because Daniel is fasting for 21 days. And uh, Gabriel comes to him after 21 days and said, I was struggling with the prince and the king of Persia, and I wasn't get, making any headway until Michael came. Okay, so right at the beginning of this last vision, we see Michael, and at the end, Michael stands up and human probation closes. So the last vision of Daniel, chapters 10 through 12, is the climax of the story of Michael. And everywhere we find Michael in the scriptures, he's in controversy with Satan. 
It's a direct confrontation with him. In fact, Sister White says the prince of Persia in Daniel 10 that Michael was dealing with and Gabriel was dealing with, the prince of Persia is Satan. The king of Persia was Cyrus. And the controversy between Satan and Christ, which we as Adventists know as the great controversy, it's symbolically represented in the name Michael, which means who is like God. And of course, that's what Satan is trying to do is take the place of God. So we, we, throw, we threw in this, that these verses, and this is these verses, if you're not understanding this, this structure because it's too busy for you. Um, <clears throat> this line here, Daniel 11, verse 40, verse 41, all the way to Daniel 12, 1. This line through this history is the history of the last six verses of Daniel 11, and therefore it is the climax of the great controversy when you understand the role of Michael. Okay, and then we went into, in connection with the role of Michael, <coughs> that Satan wants to personate Christ. He wants to, he wants to seat himself upon the th political throne of God, and he wants to sit him, seat himself upon the religious throne of God at the sides of the north. And in this sense, God's religious authority is in the sides of the north. In this sense, Satan is seeking to be the counterfeit king of the north. So when you are considering the papacy as the king of the north in these verses, we pointed out that the papacy, the Pope of Rome, is the earthly representative of Satan. And they are interchangeable many times in the scriptures. You can find passages where it's clear the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist. There are passages in inspiration where it's clear that Satan is the Antichrist. So too with the expression, the man of sin. Papacy is the man of sin, but there are places where Satan is the man of sin. So as Satan uh, prosecutes his work to try to become God on planet Earth, he uses the Pope of Rome as his earthly representative, um, but it's part of his story of the great controversy between him and Michael. But in this sense, he's the counterfeit king of the north, and so is the Pope of Rome, the counterfeit king of the north, because the true king of the north is Christ. So you, when you're talking about the last six verses of Daniel 11, you're talking about the king of the north. So you need to understand that the king of the north is a big theme in the scriptures, where the, whereas the battle between the king of the south and the king of the north is only found in chapter 11. The subject of who is the king of the tr north, the true king of the north, is throughout the scriptures, not just in Daniel 11. Okay. We pointed out that in his <coughs> uh, effort to seat, seat himself upon the throne of the earth, immediately after the Sunday law, Satan begins to personate Christ. Okay. And, and we pointed out passages where Sister White says that it was the crowning act no, it was the, anyway, in connection with developing the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, it was, says it was the, the masterpiece of his deception, masterpiece of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne of the earth and govern as he pleases, was the invention of the Catholic Church, okay? He, he, when Satan comes here and personates Christ, he wants to be God of this world, and in order to actually do that, in advance of him appearing to personate Christ, he develops a religious structure that encompasses the whole world. Okay? And that religious structure is the Catholic Church. He's going to use that religious structure to execute his religious wishes when he begins to personate Christ. But in order for him to use that religious structure, he has to prepare that religious structure to accept him to be the leader. And although we haven't spent, spent much time on it, the reality of it is, is the messages of Fatima, the messages that ha were guiding the last pope and this current pope, um, prepare a prophetic scenario for the Catholic Church to believe that we're on the verge of a limited nuclear war, the Third World War, and they believe that that war will end very quickly when Jesus returns in the heavens, and they will know that it's Jesus because he's going to call fire down out of heaven inside of men. That's the message of Fatima. Therefore, they will then turn 
the, the seat of the Pope in Rome over to Christ. But we know as Seventh-day Adventists that when Satan personates Christ in this history, that he's going to call fire down out of heaven. <clears throat> so he had to have a, 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 he wanted a worldwide church in order, you know, he didn't want, he didn't want the Mormon church because his only influence would be in Utah and in the surrounding areas. So he built a worldwide church. But he's also wanting to exercise political control. So he raises up a, <coughs> A worldwide government and that's the dragon power we've been dealing with so anyway right in this history here's where Satan personates Christ and we read a quote that he's allowed to do so until when it says until probation closes he does his marvelous works till probation closes and there's just a logic to that after every case is decided how can you be deceived one way or another it's in this time period where the, the manifestation of Satan's miracles takes place. After the Sunday Law in the United States and until the close of human probation. Then we began to look at, well before we got there, but uh, we pointed out that right down here <coughs> is Armageddon. And we pointed out from the scriptures that where the king of the north comes to his end in the scriptures, he's never in Jerusalem, he's outside of Jerusalem. And we pointed to Joel 2.20, Isaiah 10, Jeremiah 19, Isaiah 30, uh, Isaiah 28. We, we, we pointed to several places in the scriptures that show that when the king of the north attacks Jerusalem, at the end of the world, because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, that he never actually makes it into Jerusalem. In, in order to set up our understanding for the last six verses of Daniel 11, because in the last six verses of Daniel 11, the king of the or north comes to his end between the seas, and we drew the seas out, and the glorious holy mountain, and when you put a map up there, and you look at the seas, and Jerusalem, the glorious holy mountain, and you put the king of the north coming to his end, between those entities, you put him right in uh, the valley that's below the mountains that are the Carmel Mountains. In fact, every biblical battle takes place in this valley. And did you hear what I said? They all take place there. They're all connected to that same area. They may be on this side of it, this side, but they're on the edge, but they're all there. And that's where he comes to his end with none to help, and... He doesn't make it into Jerusalem. Okay, so we then begin to show that in verse 40, the three powers that lead the world to Armageddon, that lead the, the world to the same place where the king of the north comes to his end with none to help, those three powers, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, are all represented in verse 40. The king of the south is the dragon. The chariots and horsemen and ships is the United States, the false prophet. And the king of the north is the papacy. So we've been emphasizing here that if you're going to understand how the world gets led to Armageddon, and you better understand it because there's a warning in there. It's in Revelation 16, and Sister White comments on it, that you need to keep your garments in connection with these three powers leading the world to Armageddon, but that's the sixth plague. Your garments are already set one way or another by the sixth plague. Therefore, there's a warning about these three powers that lead the world to Armageddon that we must understand long before it gets to Armageddon. And the warning that we must understand is Daniel 11, verse 40, because Daniel 11, verse 40 is the Armageddon warning, because that's where the three end-time powers that are going to march the world to Armageddon begin their activity. Therefore, the warning of Armageddon is Daniel 11, verse 40. This is our review, of course. Everyone with me so far? Then we put... In this history, we begin to identify that the history of Daniel 11, verse 40, is a specific history that is specifically addressed in the scriptures. So far, we have shown four places in the scripture where the history of 1798 to the Sunday Law is marked. Okay, that's Daniel 11, verse 40. It continues to verse 41, which is the Sunday Law. There's one verse that has this same history. We looked at Tyre, Isaiah 23, when the papacy Tyre is going to be forgotten for 70 years, 
She's forgotten when she receives her deadly wound in 1798. And then she commits fornication. Okay, then she begins to sing her song at the end of the 70 years. And the 70 years is identified in Isaiah 23 as the days of one king, which is the days of one kingdom, the days of the kingdom of the United States, which begins in 1798 and ends when the United States surrenders its kingship to the Pope of Rome by committing fornication with the Pope of Rome. Right? Because the first king that she's going to commit fornication with at the end of the world is the United States, because the United States is the first to lead out, then every country will follow the example of the United States. So right here, the United States is coming into a church-state relationship with the king of the north, the papacy, just as Clovis did, finalizing this church-state relationship. And what happens here? The United States unites with the dragon. Now the United States go into the world saying, you need to set up a one-world government like we already set up in the United States that's like the way the papacy governed the world during the 1260 years. So that's the history of 1798, Tyre's forgotten, the days of one king until the Sunday law when she commits fornication with Ahab, the United States. Okay. We also looked at the story of Elijah that ends after 1260 years of drought, 1260 days of drought when Jezebel was ruling, when the Catholic Church was ruling. Then Elijah comes on the scene and among other things he identifies that when you get down here to the time of Carmel, the true and false prophet are going to be manifested. Okay, and uh, the, the true and false prophet in the history of the Millerites had to do with the Protestants rejecting the first angel's message and beginning to fulfill their role as the false prophet and the Millerite, Millerite Adventism being identified as the true prophet. But down here in our history, this is where Adventism is being divided into two classes. And one class is receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and is being, beginning to be lifted up as an ensign just in advance of the Sunday Law. And the other class is receiving the outpouring of the strong delusion just prior to the Sunday Law. And uh, that's in the story of Elijah, right? And here the true and false prophet in Adventism are demonstrated. And then we looked at the story of Chosros, the story of the long drawn out battle <coughs> be between these two powers that prefigures the long drawn out battle between the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel 11 verse 40 and we found that in this story um, what's being emphasized is after the battle ends in 1989 which would be in this history here then you expect to see Islam come into history. Because that's what happened in the history of Revelation 9. And we looked at the history of the battle of the King of the South against the King of the North, the Battle of Carchemish that later ends with the King of the North returning and defeating the King of the South. That's Daniel 11 verse 40. That's the Battle of Carchemish in the story of Josiah. And we identified that Josiah rejects the warning message of Daniel 11 verse 40 and ends up dead at Megiddo, Armageddon. Therefore saying that the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that rejects the warning message of Daniel 11 verse 40 is leading themselves to Armageddon. Okay, uh, then we began to, uh, we, I also identified that not only would this message, not only should this message be a message that identifies the events connected with the close of probation, as did John the Baptist, as did William Miller, but that in each of these histories, the message of the hour is the message that is a closed door message. And sure enough, that's what we're dealing with here, is that the Sunday law in the United States, the door closes on Seventh-day Adventists. And this is an important ingredient because we emphasize that the Bible teaches that our great, and the spirit of prophecy, our greatest need is for a revival. To seek for this is our first work. But we've been told that when we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation as we should, there'll be seen among us a great revival. And <clears throat> what persons of 
Daniel and Revelation are we supposed to understand to receive this great revival? It's a two-step message. The first one is Daniel 11. The second one is Revelation 18. Or how about Revelation 9? That's where Islam set forth. Okay, it's, it's the message of the East and the North, right? The children of the East is Islam, the king of the North. So it's Daniel 11 and Revelation 9. When we understand the books of Re Daniel and Revelation as we should, we'll understand chapters 9 and chapters 11 as we should, and there'll be seen among us a great revival. <clears throat> but what produces this revival, the, the, the truth that the Holy Spirit uses if he's going to awaken us out of our Laodicean sleep, is the fact that the door closes at the Sunday Law for Seventh-day Adventists. If you realize that from prophecy, if you realize that the next thing to happen is that the probation is going to close, and you determine to get ready for the close of probation, that what happens in your Laodicean lifestyle is there's a revival that's produced. So, when we find that in every one of these reform movements there was a shut-door message, then this adds to the, the truth about what we are sharing here, because this is, the, this is where people stumble, man. <laughs> this message in Adventism, it's Daniel 11, verse 41, because Daniel 11, verse 41 is saying, probation is about to close for Seventh-day Adventists, and this is where all the people stand up and say, oh man, you're, you're, you're using fear, you know, this is, they say lots of stuff. This is where the argument is, over the shut door message. But the reality of it is, if there's a messenger in Adventism and he doesn't teach a shut door message, then you know without even thinking about it that he's not a genuine messenger. If you're going to accept the Bible and the spirit of prophecy as your guide. Okay, <clears throat> we looked at uh, the fact that in these histories, there's always a shaking. Okay, illustrated. There's going to be a shaking. And the shaking is a subject of prophecy. Therefore, we have the right as students of prophecy to discuss the characteristics, the dynamics of this shaking, as long as we don't cross the line and get personal about some of these people that are teaching error. Okay, we pointed out that the characteristic of, of flooding the world is a characteristic of the papacy. It, it uh, overcomes the world as an overflowing scourge, as an overflowing flood. We identified that when they come into the glorious land, they enter also, meaning that as they overflowed the Soviet Union, they're going to overflow also the United States. And that when they do so, it will be at the Sunday Law. We spent time showing that the glorious land is a land, and that the word glorious means in sense of prominence, and the most prominent land in the world is the United States of America. Then we looked at how the, the United States of America fulfilled the same purpose for modern Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as did ancient Palestine fill, uh, fulfill for ancient Israel. And we added other lines of that. We're almost done with our recap. Um, we pointed out many things that are going to happen here at the Sunday Law. Okay. Satan's going to personate Christ, the final act of the man of sin. National apostasy is followed by national ruin. The greatest darkness of all time sets in in the United States. Um, and persecution begins. All right. Then we, uh, yesterday, began to look at the three enemies. The three enemies that are in verse 40. The king of the south, the king of the north, the chariot, ships, and horsemen are the beast, dragon, and false prophet. And the beast, dragon, and false prophet at the end of the world, modern Babylon is divided into three parts. And throughout the scriptures you will see these three enemies represented. And when you find them, they are representing modern Babylon at the end of the world but they are teaching different truths about modern Babylon at the end of the world. When it came to the entrance into the Promised Land in Numbers 22, or in the story of Nehemiah, the threefold enemies in both of those histories were emphasizing the, 
the negative influence that modern Babylon has upon Seventh-day Adventists as they approach the end of the world. Whereas the beast, dragon, and the false prophet in Revelation 16 are speaking about leading the world to Armageddon, not so much identifying the influence of modern Babylon in Adventism. Okay, we are now at the note 53. Let's begin here. We're still dealing with um, Daniel 11, verse 40 and 41. If you, we're going to start with Amos 3, 7. Familiar, group, familiar verse. <coughs> Let's start in verse 6. Everyone there? Amos 3, 6 says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city? A city is a kingdom. This kingdom here is the Seventh-day Adventist church, and the trumpet that's blown is the seventh trumpet on September 11, 2001. And yes, I understand that the seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22, 1844. But the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet are not only trumpets, they are woes. And the woe aspect of the seventh trumpet arrived in history on September 11th, 2001. And there was a group of people that began to play that trumpet. Okay, Verse 6, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city? Shall the third woe be announced to Adventism? And the people not be afraid? Well, the evidence is, is no, they're not afraid. They're carrying on just as they were before. Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? Does the Lord take responsibilities, responsibility for the negative fruit in Adventism? Yes, yes he does. But it's, it's not his fault. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants the prophets. And what we're saying, brothers and sisters... Is there's always a shut door message, Daniel 11, verse 41. This message is saying to Adventism, your probation's about to close. And many people that hear this message, they don't want to, want to hear it. And they'll say, oh man, you never talk about the love of Jesus, the love of Christ. It's all this prophetic stuff. And I'm telling you that the love of Christ is demonstrated by the fact that before he closes the door on Adventism, he tells them he's going to do so through the prophetic word. Amen. Daniel 11, verse 41, is the love of God in action. And the fact that we as Laodiceans spurn that love does not justify our false understanding of what Christ's love is. Because Christ's love is not human love. It's the type of love that says, yes, you are in a sinful, lost condition, and you're going to be destroyed for eternity. But I'm letting you know in advance that your probationary time is about over, and I'm fully willing to take you out of that condition and turn you into a creature that can live for eternity with the redeemed. That's love. That's Daniel 11, verse 41. Surely the Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants, the prophets. Verse 8, the lion hath roared. And who's the lion in the scriptures? It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 4 and 5 and onward, he is the one that unseals the prophecies. He's the dirt brush man. And we find him roaring in Revelation chapter 10, with the seven thunders that are sealed up until just before the close of probation. Surely the Lord God, thy God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto the servants, the prophets. How does he reveal his secrets to the servants, the prophets? The lion hath roared. He unseals the prophetic record. Who will not fear? <clears throat> oh, it's telling me my probation is going to close at the next verse in Daniel. That my probation is going to close at the Sunday law. <clears throat> That's a fearful message. You don't know, brothers and sisters, you don't know how many times after meetings and we've dealt with Daniel 11, I've had men and women come to me with tears running down their faces say, I get it, I understand it, I'm not ready. And then I've had other people say, oh, this can't be God's message because God doesn't motivate people from fear. All this is is a bunch of scare tactics. Brothers and sisters, 
This message is the most fearful message that's ever given to mankind. And if it doesn't scare you that you're in a Laodicean condition and you're about to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord, then you're brain dead. This is a fearful message. And this fear is designed to bring you to the foot of the cross that you might get ready for the close of probation. When the lion roars and he unseals this message, you should fear. Because part of the message is, is he unseals it to Laodiceans that are dead as a valley of dead dry bones. That's fearful. Should be fearful. It's not fearful. You need to pray for discernment. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord hath spoken, who can but prophesy? Publish in the palaces of Ashdod, in the palaces of the land of Egypt, and say, assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria. And behold, the great tumults in the midst thereof, and the oppressed in the midst thereof. Okay, we're to publish this message. And this message is the message that the Lord is going to assemble all nations to the mountains of Israel. He's going to assemble them right here at Armageddon. But, let's go to our notes. <clears throat> the closed door. We're still dealing with the three enemies the beast, dragon, and the false prophet, and Daniel 11, verse 41. Um, Daniel 11, verse 41 says, He, the papacy, shall enter also. He's going to come as an overflowing scourge of overflowing flood and pass over the glorious land, the United States, at the Sunday law. Many shall be overthrown. That word countries is supplied. Many shall be overthrown. That's Seventh-day Adventists that are overthrown. But these shall escape. This word escape means escape as if, if by slipperiness. It's when the bar of soap slips out of your hand in the water. But that bar of soap was in the hand. And the hand that it was in here is the hand of the king of the north, the hand of the papacy. But these shall escape out of his, the king of the north's hand. Even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, these three represent a symbol of modern Babylon. But those that escape out of his hand represents those that come out of Babylon, beginning at the Sunday Law, which is also Revelation 18, verse 4. And in Revelation 18, verse 4, it says, Come out of her, my people. At the Sunday Law in the United States, the message is now, Come out of her, my people. And the people that are coming out are coming out of Babylon, and Babylon is three parts, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, or as Daniel says, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So you have here in verse 41, and this is where some people initially have a, a struggle. You have Edom, Moab, and Ammon representing modern Babylon, but you also have the people that escape from modern Babylon there, and sometimes it's hard for people to see the distinction there, but that's what's going on. And... This is in agreement with all the testimony of end time events in the prophetic word. But we're not inventing some new scenario. What we're saying about verse 41, this is what is told about the Sunday law crisis everywhere. This is what happens. Those Seventh-day Adventists that have not prepared for the seal of God to receive the mark of the beast, they're overthrown at the Sunday law. And at that time period, those people that have prepared for the seal of God are lifted up as an ensign and they begin to call the eleventh hour workers out of Babylon. So what we're suggesting about Daniel 11 verse 40, it's Adventist through and through. Period. It just is. So in Testimonies, volume 9, page 97, it says, more and more as the days go by, it is becoming apparent that God's judgments are in the world. Do you see that? In fire and flood and earthquake, he is warning the inhabitants of, his, of, the earth, of this earth of his near approach. The time is nearing when the great crisis in the history of the world will have come, when every movement in the government of God will be watched with intense interest and inexpressible apprehension. In quick succession, the judgments of God will follow one another, fire, flood, and earthquake, with war and bloodshed. Oh, that the people of God might know the time of their visitation. Now, this is number 53, and we've had two that aren't numbered, so this is number 55, and we have did them one day at a time, so this is way back when, when we started this worship series. But for those of you that have watched it all the way through, and for those of you that haven't, you can go back and check. We've already established 
when the time of God's visitation begins. When does the time of God's visitation begin? And the answer is, is when did the time of God's visitation begin in the time of Christ? Mark 1, 14, 15, so the time is fulfilled. What time was that? Daniel 9. But what time was it? Pardon me? No, 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 no. That's not the time of visitation. It's not the birth of Jesus. He was, he was obscure for 30 years. When does the time of visitation... 27 AD. 27 AD at what event? When the dove comes down out of heaven, that's the beginning of the time of God's visitation. And how long did he visit him for? He confirmed the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he was what? Cut off. So right here is his baptism... And right here, that's the Sunday law, that's the crucifixion. And right here, that's Stephen getting stoned when Michael stands up. So this is the time of God's visitation. It begins when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. Oh, that the people of God might know the time of their visitation. There are many with whom... There are many who have not heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is a time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. <clears throat> Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out. Notice this. His hand is stretched out. I want you to see that. His hand is stretched out. Why do I want you to see that? Because in Daniel 11.41, that's what this is talking about, this passage. Right here at the Sunday Law. Okay? Begins the time of God's destructive judgments, which is a time of mercy for those that have not never had opportunity to know the truth. And who is it that has never had opportunity to know the truth? Is it Seventh-day Adventists? No. No, they know, they've had opportunity. They're going to be held accountable for the truth. Right here at the Sunday Law. But at the Sunday Law, what happens at the Sunday Law? National apostasy is followed by national, national ruin. Okay, This is the time of God's destructive judgments, but it is a time of mercy for those that have never known the truth. And right here, what does the Lord have? He has His hand stretched out. Who else has His hand stretched out? The United States right here is stretching His hand out to take the hand of the papacy, stretching out his hand to take the hand of spiritualism. And then right here, what's happening with those people in Babylon that are coming out? They're escaping the hand of the papacy. What for? Because Jesus has his hand stretched out. They're going from the hand of the papacy to the hand of Christ. You have to watch the hand in this scenario because it's part of Daniel 11, verse 41. Christ is stretching out his hand to the 11th hour workers at the Sunday Law because they just escaped the hand of the papacy at the very point in time when the United States is taking the hand of the papacy and spiritualism. Okay? His hand is stretched out to save while what? The doors, the doors close to those who would not enter. Right there. Closed door message. Daniel 11 verse 41, Sunday law, closed door message. Surely the Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants, the prophets. The mercy of God is shown in his long forbearance. He is, but his mercy is shown, but what does his long forbearance do to me? It tells me, ah, I can continue playing around with this idol because I've been playing around with this idol for three or four years and the Lord hasn't slapped my hand about it yet, so I'm okay. If you're on the wrong side of the issue, you think his mercy has given you license to continue on in your Laodicean experience. But that's a misreading of God's love and mercy. That's to be noted because the Adventists that are on the wrong side of the issue have a misconception about God's love and God's mercy. And this is part of the story. His mercy, his long-suffering is interpreted by one group as an attribute of who he is, and by the other group, it's attributed to the fact that he's letting them continue in their sinful condition because he's not really a God of judgment. The mercy of God is shown in his long forbearance. He is holding back his judgments, waiting for the message of warning to be sounded to all. Oh, if our people would feel as they should, the responsibility resting upon them to give the last message of mercy to the world what a wonderful work would be done. 
<coughs> this next quote is virtually the same, but she wrote, rewrote it. It says, probationary time will not continue much longer. I like it because she's using the word probation and Seventh-day Adventists do not like hearing the word probation when it's connected with the word close. <laughs> probationary time will not continue much longer. Now God is withdrawing his restraining hand from the earth. Long he has been speaking to men and women through the agency of his Holy Spirit, but they have not heeded the call. Now he is speaking to his people and to the world by his judgments. Can you, can you read sign language? That's what it is. The drought we're in, the fires, the floods that are going on around the world, the wars, that's the voice of God. Oh, where did I? Okay. Now he's speaking to his people and to the world by his judgments. The time of these judgments is a time of mercy for those who have had not yet had opportunity to learn what truth. Ted, will the Lord look upon them? His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save. Large numbers will be admitted into the fold of safety who in these last days will hear the truth for the first time. How many folds are there? There's two folds. The fold of Adventism is going to have large numbers of the other flock come in. That happens right here. When the time of God's destructive judgments begin, national apostasy is followed by national ruin, but it's a time of mercy for the 11th hour workers. Isaiah 56, 8, we've looked at a few times. We'll put it in the record once more. Isaiah 56, 8. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, yet will I gather all others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. On this side of the Sunday law, right here, the Lord has gathered the outcasts of Israel because he's going to lift the outcasts of Israel up as an ensign, but he's going to gather others. That's the 11th hour workers, and he gathers the others in the time period that is called the time of God's destructive judgments, which is a time of mercy. Isaiah 11, verse 2, make sure we remember who the outcasts of Israel are. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding the Spirit. I got the wrong quote there, the wrong verse. Um, verse 12, I left out the one on 12. Isaiah eleven twelve, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and to gather together the dispersed of Judah for the four corners of the earth. So he first gathers the outcasts of Israel, he assembles them, and then he gathers others to them. That's this history right here. Verse 40 and 41. <coughs> Vacancy. You ever driven someplace and looking for a hotel and there's no vacancy? There's going to be a vacancy in this history. There are diligent students of prophecy in all parts of the world who are obtaining light and still greater light from searching the scriptures. This is true of all nations and of all tribes and of all, and all peoples. These will come from the grossest error and will take the place of those who have had opportunity and privileges and have not prized them. We, early on in this worship service, identified who it is that has had great light and opportunities. Who is that? Seventh-day Seventh Adventists. And these people that are coming from gross darkness are going to do what? Take the places of Seventh-day Adventists that reject this message. People don't like, like it when I say it like that. <laughs> That's the way it is. Pardon me? It doesn't have to be that way. The, the ball's in your court, as they say. It doesn't have to be that way. Continuing on. These have worked out, these people that come, the 11th hour workers from gross darkness, these have worked out their own salvation with fear and tremble, lest they become deficient in doing the ways and wills of God. While those who have had great light have, through perversity of their own natural hearts, turned away from Christ because displeased with his requirements. But God will not be left without witness. The one-hour laborers will be brought in at the eleventh hour, 
and will consecrate ability and all their entrusted means to advance the work. They're going to put all their entrusted means to advance the work. These will receive the reward for their faithfulness because they are true to principle and shun not their duty to declare the whole counsel of God. When those who have had abundance of light throw off the restraint which the word of God imposes and make void as law, others will come in and fill their places and take their crown. Great is the work of the Lord. Men are choosing sides. Even those supposed heathen will choose the side of Christ while those who become offended, as did the disciples, will go and walk no more with him, and others will come in and occupy the place they have left vacant. The time is very near when man shall have reached the prescribed limits, the records of their works in the books of heaven, is weighed in the balances and found wanting. Please notice that this is taking place with an emphasis of the judgment. We know this is the judgment of the living. And these 11th hour workers are going to replace Seventh-day Adventists who have just been typified by Sister White as the disciples that turned and walked no more with Christ. And we've dealt with that in this worship series. It was when Christ told the story right here of the manna, of the bread that came down out of heaven, that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood, that the disciples in that history, more than any other time, more disciples at that point, turned away from Christ. Why? Because they were unwilling to approach God's word from the prophetic approach. They, didn't, uh, they, they were unwilling to see that when he was talking about his flesh and his blood, that they were to understand it as a spiritual symbol. They thought they wanted, they thought, they didn't think it, I don't believe, but they claimed that he was wanting them to be cannibals. They refused to accept the prophetic message. And when is it that they turned and walked with him no more? It was in John 666. Okay, so Sister White's been clear about that history of John applying to our day and age in the transition that takes place between verses 40 and 41. In Daniel 11. Next quote. We know that unconsecrated Seventh-day Adventists who have a knowledge of the truth but ha who have linked themselves with worldlings will depart entirely from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. The enemy will gladly hold out inducements to them to lead, to lead them to carry on a warfare against the people of God. But those who are true and steadfast will have a strong and powerful defense in God. Seventh-day Adventists are going out. Word to the little flock. <clears throat> I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers. What's the, what's the separating point? The Sabbath. Here's the, here's the line in the sand, the Sabbath. All the way through. All the way through. From this point on, what separates the, the true from the false is the Sabbath issue. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers and that the Sabbath is the great test question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. And if one believed, is this the Seventh-day Adventist she's going to talk about here? And if one believed and kept the Sabbath and received the blessing attending it and then gave it up, when do they give it up? As the, at the Sunday law or as they see the Sunday law approaching, they give it up and broke the Holy Commandment, they would what? shut the gates of the holy city against themselves. They're going to close their own probation at the Sunday law. As sure as there was a God that rules in heaven above, I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. Here's the 11th hour workers. <clears throat> they had not rejected the light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, and I want you to focus in here, and Adventists, Adventism, we understand the time of trouble begins when Michael stands up and human probation closes, but that isn't the time of trouble she's speaking about here. We're going to let her define that in a minute. They had not rejected light, light on it, and at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the church, nominal Adventists, as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. At this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth, and they came out and endured persecution with us. 
And Sister White explains this time of trouble in early writings. She uses the same quote. And in the appendix of early writings, she says this. On page 30, 33 is given the following. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers. And the Sabbath is a great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They were not rejected light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. <clears throat> this view was given in 1847 when there were but very few of the Advent brethren observing the Sabbath. And of these, but few supposed that its observance was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is beginning to be seen. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plagues shall begin to be poured out. It doesn't refer to here. This is the great time of trouble. Okay, it doesn't refer to that. But to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. It's in what we would call the judgment of the living. Okay, that's what this time of trouble refers to in, in just terminology. A short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, what's Christ's closing work? The blotting out of sins. When does the blotting out of sins take place? The judgment of the living. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check. The nations became angry on September 11, 2001, and George Bush and the United Nations instantly put a restraint upon Islam. The nations were angered, angered but then immediately restrained. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth. The nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, at what time? At the time when the nations are made angry, yet held in check. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come. Hmm, this is the beginning of the latter rain. What time is she talking about here? She's talking about a time of trouble. She said it's a time of trouble that takes place during the closing work of salvation. And then she tells us at that time the nations will be angry yet held in check. And then she tells us at that time the latter rain begins to sprinkle. This little time of trouble, although I, we just read a quote previously that allows you to mark the beginning of the time of trouble and this is what, where I've always marked it at the Sunday Law. But this here is telling us that the little time of trouble in one sense begins at 9-11. And you can track it, brothers and sisters, the disasters and wars and tidal waves, earthquakes that have been hitting since 9-11. Now certainly they're going to greatly increase at the Sunday law because national apostasy is followed by national ruin. But right here, these judgments that are the little time of trouble, what are they? They're God's voice. They're God's voice. To who? Seventh-day Adventists. Saying you better wrap your mind around verse 40 and 41 because probation's about to close. When those that believe that not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and believe a lie, then the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it and all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call, come out of her, my people, Revelation 18.4. This is when they're called out. And a symbol of this is the story of Lot. You can see Luke 17.29-30 there in your notes. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone upon from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So Christ is saying that the story of Lot is an illustration of the end of the world when the Son of Man is revealed. When's the Son of Man revealed? <clears throat> When's the Son of Man revealed? And the whole earth is like what is glory. 
Okay, but when he's, when's he revealed? I, I, I could, you can make that argument in 9-11, but when's he revealed? At the second coming, but when's he revealed? At the end sign. At the Sunday law, he's revealed because the end sign is a group of people that perfectly reflect the character of Christ, and the world then is going to be choosing between the end sign, Christ, and Barabbas, the personation of Christ, by Satan. This is when he's revealed. When was he revealed in the story of Daniel 3? When they were thrown in the fiery furnace, then he appears, and the whole world sees him. He's revealed at the Sunday law. And Lot is a symbol of the Sunday law. And Sister White says this. She says in early writings 278, Servants of God endowed with power from on high with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration went forth to proclaim the message of heaven. Souls that were scattered all through the religious bodies answered to the call and precious were hurried out of the doomed churches as Lot was hurried out of Sodom before her destruction. Now the reason that I'm turning the corner here and talking about Lot is because Daniel 11, verse 41, Ammon and Moab are Lot's daughters and his descendants from that incestuous relationship. So we find that Lot's daughters, that, that lineage, is a symbol of those that come out of Babylon at the Sunday law, but we see that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy confirms this <laughs> from other directions. Go to Second Chronicles 20, verse 20. Second Chronicles. Of course, this is, we probably all can quote this verse, right? <coughs> and they rose up early in the morning and went forth. Uh, who is this that's rising up? This is Jehoshaphat, right? And this, is, this is when he's going to use the military tactic of just going out into battle with the singers leading the way and letting the Lord doing the fighting. Everyone knows that story, right? And they rose up early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his, believe his prophet, so shall you prosper. Where do we see the echo of that verse? Isaiah 7, verse 8 or 9, isn't it? Okay, and what, what's, what are you supposed to believe in Isaiah 7 when this verse is being echoed? That's what we're, the 2520, but we're not, we're not dealing with that. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established, and believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and should... And, and that should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, said, Ambushments against who? The enemies. Okay, brothers and sisters, right here, the 144,000, the end sign. What does Revelation say about these people? Do they have a song? Yes. They're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. That's going to be their battle cry. They're going to go out right here singing, and what are they going to bring down? And the Lord sent ambush against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. Who's Mount Seir? Edom. That's Edom. Okay. Same three enemies that are in Daniel 11, verse 41. Edom, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come up against Judah, and they were smitten. They're coming against Judah. Ah, those three enemies must be the king of the north. They must be modern Babylon that's coming against Jerusalem. But they get smitten, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Um, go to Isaiah 11. We're now looking at Edom, Moab, and Ammon from the perspective that they represent the threefold union of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. They represent the enemy that comes against Jerusalem about the, against the glorious holy mountain at the end of the world. And in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 11 is in connection with Isaiah 10, and Isaiah 10, 1 is a pronouncement against those that make unrighteous decrees in verse 1 of Isaiah 10. And Sister White says that this unrighteous decree in verse 1 of chapter 10 of Isaiah is the Sunday law. And the narrative just continues on 
into chapter 11 and even into chapter 12, but in chapter 11, verse 10, in the time of the Sunday law history, it says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Okay, in the Sunday law time period, the Lord is going to lift up an ensign and his Sabbath and his latter reign are going to be glorious and many people are going to respond to this truth. Verse 11, And it shall come to pass that the Lord shall set his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outside casts of Israel and to get, gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. This is from the story of Gideon and Sister White comments on this verse, this phrase in early writings. And she says it's a symbol of unity that will come into the work during the latter reign. The envy of e envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Em Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim, but they shall fly upon the shoulder of the Philistines towards the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their what? They're going to lay their hand on who? Edom, Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. These are the people that just escaped the hand of the papacy because the Lord had his hand stretched out still, and the Lord's going to use his ensign people to put their hands upon Edom, Moab, and Ammon and lead them into an obedience of the truth. That's what it says. The children shall obey them. And they're not going to be their servants. They're, they're going to instruct them into the understanding of the Sabbath that they might obey the warning message of the hour. And verse 15 says, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. What's the tongue of the Egyptian sea? The tongue is what you use to speak. The speaking of a nation is an action of his legislative and judicial authorities. Egypt is the world, the, the world that's going to pass a world Sunday law. And that's all coming down in flames. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea with his mighty wind. Shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite the seven streams and make men go over a dry shod. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. This is the final deliverance of God's people. This is the final people that come out of modern Babylon, represented as Edom, Edom Moab, and Ammon. But in Daniel 11, verse 41, we have these same three people representing modern Babylon, but also, as Isaiah is doing, using this symbol of modern Babylon to show where the 11th hour workers come out from. But these 11th hour workers in Isaiah 11 are the very last ones to come out. They come out just before the final deliverance. But if you go to Daniel 11:41, we will show you one thing before we close. <coughs> Daniel 11:41. And he, the papacy, shall enter also into the United States, the glorious land. And many Seventh-day Adventists shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of the hand of the papacy, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. This is the difference between Second Chronicles 20 and Isaiah 11. Here these three tribes are associated with the chief of the children of Ammon, and this word chief it means first fruits. Therefore, what is being said here in Daniel 11.41 is the very first people to come out of Babylon do so in Daniel 11 verse 41 at the Sunday Law in the United States. This is where Revelation 18.4 begins, come out of her, my people, and the first people to come out of Babylon come out in Daniel 11, verse 41, and they're represented not simply as Edom, Moab, and Ammon, but the chief of the children of Ammon, and the word chief means first fruits. They're the first to come out of Babylon because it all starts in verse 41 at the Sunday Law.
in the United States. Let me, let me read through these next quotes um, quickly because they are important, but they're not a primary point that I want to make, and I don't want to have to remake them to start the next presentation tomorrow, but I do want to get them in the record. The Hand, okay? Testimonies, Volume 5. When our nation so, so observe the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will, in this act, join hands with the papacy. The next quote talks about how the United States prepares to join hands with the papacy. The next quote from Testimonies, Volume 4, is one of those quotes where the United States is stretching its hand to grasp the hand of spiritualism and also Rome. Point being here is that one of the things you have to watch in Daniel 11.41, once you know it's the Sunday Law, then you have all the other lines. Remember, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You have all the other lines of inspiration to bring in here to realize that the hand is one of the issues here. Here's where the United States is taking the hand of the dragon, taking the hand of the king of the north. Here's where the 11th hour workers, represented as Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, escape the hand of the papacy. And it's at this point that the ensign, the wise of Adventism, are laying their hands upon those people to lead them into obedience because Christ has his hand stretched out to save. So this hand is a symbol that's worth noting in this verse. And you want to know it because in the next verse he's going to stretch his hand, the king of the north, out upon Egypt as well. Okay, steps in clasping the hand of the papacy. You're walking in its steps. Um, you can see that under here, Great Controversy 588. And uh, you see a couple of quotes about the United States walking in step with the papacy. And Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? So when they are clasping hands, it means they're in agreement, they're walking together, and we want to know this because when we get to verse 43, uh, Libya and Ethiopia are going to be in his steps, meaning the whole world is going to come into agreement with the papacy. They're going to walk with him. That's one of the, the little themes in these verses that you need to see. But when you join hands with the papacy, you're walking with the papacy. You're in agreement with the papacy. When you escape his hand, you're going into the hand of Christ. Now, another argument that's sometimes brought up is, well, yeah, maybe the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989, but there's still communists in the world. What about China? What about Vietnam? So on and so forth. The Old Testament prophecies are illustrated with the geography of the Middle East. Okay? The Old Testament prophecies are illustrated with the geography of the Middle East. But the end of the world prophecies, they are to be applied to Christendom. That's what Sister White says. Run the word Christendom in the Spirit of Prophecy CD-ROM. And you'll find that the focus of end time Bible prophecy is to be illustrated in Christendom. And Christendom is a, a, a word that we don't use here in modern America, but it was a common word in the time of Ellen White. And it has a specific definition. Christendom are the countries in the world that have come under a, a strong influence of Christianity, such as Europe and the Americas. Okay, Europe and Americas is Christendom. You gotta have a few quotes here. Uh, Review and Herald, February 7th, 1893. In the great conflict between faith and unbelief, the whole Christian world will be involved. Um, passing over the big quote to Selected Messages, Book 3, the so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive action. What's the theater? The theater is the Christian world. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because Sister White tells us when it comes to the Sunday Law crisis, every nation in the world is going to be involved, including nations like India and China. But when it comes to applying end-time Bible prophecy, you don't worry about India and China. They're outside the geographical scope of Christendom. Russia is Christendom. Europe is Christendom. The sweeping away of the King of the South in 1989 is in that region. region, whereas China isn't, okay? 
It's not so much about communism, it's about the movement of the dragon from atheistic France to the Soviet Union to the United Nations. It's about the movement of the dragon because the dragon is one of the three powers that's leading you and I to Armageddon. So it's about Christendom. Um, last quote, as the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, the religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of Sunday. The persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. What's universal mean? Worldwide. Worldwide. So the focus of end time Bible prophecy is in the geography of Christendom. So we're not worried about communism in China or Vietnam. The king of communism in Christendom was swept away in 1989 in fulfillment of Daniel 11 verse 40 and that was the key to let Seventh-day Adventists understand that the next thing that was going to happen was their probation was going to close and if they don't prepare for that event they're going to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father we we thank you that you are allowing us to see your work in opening these verses of Scripture, in confirming uh, their relationship to our history as Seventh-day Adventists, a history that includes a scattering time when the foundational truths are covered up. We thank you that you're uncovering these truths and leading us to an understanding that our probation is about to close. We ask that you'd give us the faithfulness and the courage to bring our life into agreement with these truths. We ask that you'd provide opportunities for us to share these things with individuals that we might give out the oil you've given to us in order to receive more. We set before you this day of service, the other messages that are coming. We ask that you would bless uh, Pastor Sankey's presentation this day, bless the work that we're doing with the recording and the live streaming. And uh, let us do what we do for you today safely in a way that will glorify you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.